situation? Um, I mean, I think the, the practical answer is that it is too nuanced to really understand from so far away. Um, I think the good news is things like these meetings probably say there's some amount of effort being given, but the reality is most people in Silicon Valley don't even understand what AI is. And so the idea that, you know, until we really grapple with what it really means, what actually exists, you know, fact versus fiction, um, it's probably going to take many years before government really understand what's at risk and what's at play. We saw Mark Zuckerberg testify before Congress. Many of the lawmakers didn't seem to quite understand how Facebook works. <laughs> That said, do you think tech needs to be regulated? And do you think Congress can design the right regulation? Well, I, I think the right way to think about this is when technology was a small part of the economy, it was probably best left alone. And I think we did a good job of self-regulating. Now the reality is technology is pervasive, right? There is no industry that isn't being refactored or remade by something new using technology at its core. And so with that, I think, should come a natural expectation that we need to live by the same rules as everybody else has. So a few months ago, you talked about how you feel tremendous guilt about what you built at Facebook. It caused a bit of a stir, as some things you say do. Um, and you later said that you genuinely believe Facebook is a force for good in the world. That was before Cambridge Analytica. And there may be many more Cambridge Analyticas. We have no idea how many. We have no idea how many millions or even billions of people may have had their data compromised. So how does that impact your, your level of guilt now? Look, I think the reality is that Facebook is probably going to be the company that leads the way out. Um, but the reality is that there's a bigger problem, which is um, not a Facebook problem. It's a question amongst all of us as consumers. We have grown addicted to things that are free. And we very rarely pay for things when asked to on the internet. It's just not an expectation. But in the rest of our lives, we actually expect to pay for things. Ford doesn't give us free cars. You know, Whole Foods doesn't give us free grapes. We have to pay for all of these things. And with those payments comes expectations and rights and privileges, et cetera. And so similarly, I think what we have to do as consumers is ask ourselves, how much of this do we want to have for free? And if we want rights, how much are we willing to pay for those rights? And those rights should extend to things like data privacy, et cetera. I think in that is the solution to future versions of this problem. So you think Facebook should do a subscription model? Um, I think that's too tactical of a solution. I think it's a bigger question at hand, which is we have all assumed that the only way to make money on the internet is to give software away for free and then use advertising to make up the difference. The problem with that is that we have a very weird an undefined gray area between who is the consumer, who is the customer, and how much of a product are you a part of. And I think that's where you have to introduce things like payment and subscription so that those marks are clear. For example, when you look at Netflix's business model, it is unambiguously clear. There is a bi-party relationship between Netflix and the consumer. Spotify has the same thing. Apple, in many ways, has the same thing. When you're a customer of Amazon Prime, you have the same thing. And so I think there are many examples now of an evolution of internet business models. And for example, in my organization, a lot of what we talk about is that. And how do we move away from just relying on ad-supported businesses and think about an embracing subscription because it clarifies a lot of these problems. So let's talk about something we definitely don't get for free, and that is a Tesla. Um, you once said that you think Apple should buy Tesla and make Elon Musk CEO. That was a long time ago. Um, the last few weeks, we've seen Elon Musk calling analyst questions boneheaded and boring. Um, we've seen bad April Fool's jokes. Um, what do you think about that kind of behavior? Is that okay? So um, unlike most people who read the peanut gallery version of that earnings call, as a large holder of the convertible bonds, I actually listened to the call. And I, honestly, what I would tell you is that I think that a lot of this stuff was overblown. Now, mm -hmm. in fairness to public market investors, they provide critical liquidity for his companies. And specifically in Tesla's case, they are at a critical point where they may need more money. And so I do think it makes sense to make sure that you have the right kind of exchange. I'm not sure though, quite honestly, whether quarterly earnings calls are the best ways to get at them. I think they're too perfunctory in general. And for a business as nuanced as Tesla, there's frankly really no opportunity to ask the right questions. In fact, what I would rather see Elon do is take the four or five analysts that really understand the business and at the top of the list I would put Adam Jonas mm. 
and I would bring him under the tent and say, let me really explain these businesses to you and then have you articulate that to the rest of the Wall Street. And I think that would probably be a step that bridges the gap between people's interpretation of the call and people's frustration with the actual content of the call. Let's talk about Apple. You know, in the past, you've talked about how they have a problem with innovation. We've seen, however, Apple earnings, and I know we don't love quarterly earnings, but defy expectation just by being stable and sort of defying the, the smartphone market slump. Do you think Apple still has an innovation problem? Um, I think that Apple has a fantastic cash machine. I don't think Apple has demonstrated yet what the next lily pad is. Mm. And why that's so critical in technology businesses is that the underpinnings of your business model are constantly changing. So, you know, simple example, if we move from ad supported businesses to subscription, but we may move from subscription to something else. There may be something that comes after a phone. Perhaps it's a VR headset. In all of this is a lot of change. And so in order to accommodate change, I think the best course of action is to try many things. Be okay with failure. Don't be embarrassed by it. It's learning and it'll help you refine the ultimate thing that works. And so I, as a investor, would love to see more public facing experimentation that says, we know that the iPhone business isn't going to be around forever, and so we're going to try some things at scale. Now, in fairness to them, they've tried some things that are exceptional. For example, AirPods are fabulous. That is an unbelievable product. I think everybody who uses them loves them. But certainly not the price point of an iPhone, even but though they are point, still expensive. That's an excellent for point. <laughs> it is not going to be the thing that replaces the iPhone business. And so you need to find multi hundred billion dollar or trillion dollar markets. And for whatever reason, there are only a few healthcare education, autos, housing. And so they have to try something big, I think. You've talked about some public market stocks you think are undervalued, Box, for example. What else? Where do you see opportunity that public market investors aren't seeing? Yeah, so uh, if we go back to where we started, I really think that over the next 15 to 20 years, consumers are waking up to the realization that they are going to want to have rights and be the ultimate customer. What that means is I believe businesses like Netflix, Spotify, and there are many others that are subscription based are going to do incredibly well. And in fact, I think that they will massively overperform other kinds of business models. And in part, what that means is those other kinds of businesses, ad supported businesses will get revalued and re-rated in my opinion. There will also be the scepter of regulation. There will be the scepter of privacy risks. And so to me, where we are spending a lot of time uh, is finding companies that express that view, subscription-based relationships with customers. Why isn't the industry changing faster? Why are you one of the few people out there talking about this? Um, I think there are two reasons. The first is that there is a dirty little secret in Silicon Valley, which is that um, there's not a lot of incentive to change because technology markets are frankly quite small still, and they're growing very, very quickly. And so the returns you generate by basically staying the same are high enough to keep you in business for a very long time. So the fundamental underlying incentives for general partners or venture capital firms to retool don't exist. Now, why are we doing it differently? Because to be honest with you, I just think it's a poor business decision. I think that if you put the best people on the field and in order to get those people, you close your eyes and ask the same questions and make the same judgments, you end up with a more diverse team because you find that there are people you would otherwise exclude who are frankly better than the people you would otherwise pick. Give me the evidence. Is it showing in your returns? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, you know, the way that we look at it quite simply is like, how performant are we relative to the S&P 500? And it's dramatically overperformant. And again, I, you know, I think back and I say, who has built a top decile firm in Silicon Valley over the last 10 years? Right? Who can compete with Kleiner or Sequoia or Excel? And I would say that there are three organizations, Andreessen Horowitz, Y Combinator, and ourselves. And now we've all taken different approaches to get there. My organization only started seven years ago. So to have done this in such a short amount of time, I think represents um, a commitment to this idea that really good, thoughtful hiring of people who are qualified, independent of race, gender, creed, etc., just turns out to be the smartest business decision you can make, so why not do it? One of your new experiments is called Capital as a Service, where you've basically built this machine or this algorithm that will identify companies, global entrepreneurs around the world um, without any humans being involved. And basically the computer decides whether or not 
they get funding. What sort of results are you seeing? Like, does this model actually work? Yeah, in fact, you know, humans do get involved. It's just that after the computers make a recommendation. And what we found even in our first batch was these were businesses that um, 40% were founded by women, 80% were founded by minorities. They were companies that spanned 17 countries of the globe. Many of the states in the U.S. that would never have received venture capital funding, meaning not California, not New York. And so what we find is actually what you think we find, which is there are amazing people everywhere. And they're trying their best to solve really important problems that improve the quality of life of the people around them. And when you take a need-blind approach and instead ask simple questions that have everything to do with the quality of the business versus the demographic makeup of the founder, you invariably find an amazing collection of people. And you intend to scale this to 10,000 investments next year. I, you know, I, I have told the team that my goal, if they can execute and build this thing for scale, is to support 1,000 companies this year and 10,000 a year every year thereafter. Now, listen, part of you know, managing a really sophisticated technology team is to set audacious goals. It's not clear yet whether we'll be able to build it to such a scale. And to be honest with you, it's also not clear whether 10,000 investable opportunities a year exist. But just by mandating something like this, I think what it allows us to do is really ask the hard questions. How do we train our algorithms? How do we use data judiciously? How do we help businesses that may be very close to funding get over the line and be better? Mm -hmm. How do we actually become more democratic in teaching people how to be entrepreneurial? You know, how do we integrate with the massive companies like Amazon and Google so that people can start businesses in an even simpler way? So it's forcing these conversations and frankly, in many ways, it brings me back to my roots of just building really interesting products that start with very small steps but can turn out to be quite transformational over years. Speaking of AI and algorithms, you know, I know you see a big opportunity there. How are we thinking about this and, and, and are we thinking about AI in the right way? I think that AI is sort of a misnomer and the, the reason why it's a misnomer is that um, people think about these computers making decisions for us. But there's actually an important step that happens before it, which is how does a computer get trained? Well, a computer gets trained with enormous amounts of data. And so really what we well, are fighting... Well, and data and AI and computers, are, they're not necessarily unbiased. They're not. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about the iteration of how mm -hmm. things, things you know, improve over time. Mm -hmm. But the point is that this is a land grab for data. And you know, why there's so much concern about these large companies, the large internet companies, is because of the enormity of the data that they've collected. Because on the one hand, you could use it to improve basic core services, but on the other hand, it may be too much power in the hands of a few. And so what we really need to do is have a more nuanced discussion. When we talk about AI and we talk about the perils of it, it really comes down to who is collecting the critical information that will train our computers over the next 20 to 30 years to make important differentiated decisions on our behalf. So who is? I mean, who's 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 in the lead? Well, there's the is obvious it? companies in certain categories. Uh -huh. So if you said, you know, who is going to be the leader in collecting data around consumption, I would say it's Amazon. Yeah. If you asked about, you know, intent, it would be Google. If you talked about content consumption, it would be Facebook. Uh -huh. But for example, in healthcare, there's no clear winner yet. Mm -hmm. In education and adaptive learning, there's no clear winner yet. Mm -hmm. In financial regulation, the issuance of credit, uh, there's no clear winner yet. So there's these many, many markets where we don't know yet. Um, and so now it's about figuring out how to start companies, quite honestly, who think about this as their core primary reason to exist, and then collect data and then use it in a really thoughtful and honorable way. I have to ask you about the SPAC. So you've raised $600 million to help startups go public. And $690 million, yeah. excuse me, to help startups go public unconventionally. Everybody wants to know if a startup has been chosen. Has a startup been chosen? <laughs> I can't comment. I'm trying to read your body language. You're very excited about it. No comment. Um, no comment. Would you consider an overseas company if they were consumer friendly? I really can't comment. Okay. Yeah. But why? Um, you know, part, part of it is that I want, I want to respect the confidentiality of the process, but also part of it is just the practical realities of SEC regulation, which I want to honor. And um, so until there's a deal to be done, we can't say anything. Um, but I really think, by the way, more generally speaking, um, we're going to find a lot of utility for products like this because what it allows us to do is bring 
scaled financial capabilities and toolboxes to tech businesses. And I think what that will do is accelerate great companies to being fantastic.